All right, next up, we have operations and monitoring of production ML at Condé Nast. We have Max Cantor, software engineer on the machine learning team at Condé Nast, who will be speaking about Spire, a framework that they have built for user segmentation and targeted advertising for over 100 million users. Spire maintains thousands of models trained weekly or monthly and user propensity scores um, are derived from these models daily. Max will outline the requirements of a production ML software product, um, how they built their platform and what they learned through its development. Thank you for being with us, Max. Uh, take it away. Hi, I'm Max Cantor. I'm a software engineer of machine learning at Condé Nast. And today I'll be talking about the operations and monitoring of our production machine learning code. Condé Nast is an international co company that uh, serves over 28 markets, over 200, an audience of over 240 million. We receive over 110 million monthly unique visitors, over 800 million monthly page views, and over 100,000 monthly new or revised pieces of content. So in addition to being a media company, we also use this all of this data for various machine learning endeavors, uh, one of which I will be discussing today, our largest machine learning platform, Spire. So these data feed into our models. And when you're dealing with data of this scale, this kind of big data, it's especially important to have clear and efficient monitoring tools. So again, Spire is a machine learning platform developed at Condé Nast. It produces user propensity predictions for advertisement campaigns, utilizing thousands of models that are currently in production and supports rapid configuration for new campaigns. So in order to facilitate uh, thousands of models and rapid configuration and, and, and dealing with the scale of big data, we need to have uh, good monitoring practices. So some of the challenges that we face in terms of monitoring are uh, how do you monitor with an appropriate precision? So for instance, you might have a query that just at a binary level is saying, did a model fail or succeed? However, when you're dealing with big data, uh, such as in our case, our models are deployed on Spark clusters through uh, AWS EC2 instances. And so if for whatever reason, a cluster fails to launch, then that's not necessarily going to show up in your query on failed models uh, if the query is checking of the models that were launched, which ones failed. So you would need to have some additional check like of the models that were expected to launch, which ones did. So even if you have the best tools and the you know, maximum number of resources, you need to be asking the right kinds of questions or all of that monitoring is for naught. Uh, so following up on that, then you might think, well, what if I just logged everything? What if I just reported everything? Uh, but at a certain point that uh, becomes counterproductive as well. So, so what is too little and what is too much information? Uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen, if you encounter an error at one place, sometimes that error is just an epiphenomenon of some other process far upstream. And maybe there was some warning that that other process wasn't working as expected. But if you're logging everything, that warning might get drowned out and off the noise and all you see is that error. So you really want to think about what actually are the key choke points or the, the, the key points at which there might be issues. So at a given stage, what upstream stages could have affected that? And, and really, you only want to be looking at those. So then that leads to the next question of how you go about doing that. So there are various tools you can use of which we'll discuss and, and data visualization, of course. Uh, but really, you want to capture the order of those operations based on what pieces of information are most pertinent and what questions you're trying to answer. So next, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show an example of our day-to-day -day monitoring process now, keep in mind that many of these processes are things that we can actually do live, do on an hourly basis, real time, um, that, and that we have additional tooling as well. But this is just our 
basic top level every morning, here's how we go about it. At the very top, we have a Slack report. So this is just a report that gets pushed to a Slack channel. So Slack is used ubiquitously at Condé Nast. So it was just a logical first step for monitoring. And we, we actually have a dedicated channel for this automatic process report. So we receive a report like this, which shows for our models, the various stages and whether or not they were successful, whether they were uh, launched or failed to launch, and then produces a subsequent report with more details. So just as a little bit of an explanation, the scoring, this is just the model prediction, the, the inference stage. This is done on a daily basis across all uh, active models. Then we have what's called assembly. This is really more just kind of our internal term for pre-processing and then the model training itself. And uh, the assembly and training occurs on a weekly or monthly basis, varying by the workflows themselves. Uh, sorry, the, the data abstractions, which we call workflows. And I'll, I'll um, explain those in greater detail later. And then you can see here, there was uh, in this example, one workflow that failed to assemble, and we have a log that gets produced for that. So in this log, we see various data associated with the business logic of the model, of the, again, the, the workflow logic, the underlying code base logic of it, a description and error handling that's coming from our code base itself. Uh, and then there are additional logs that can be followed up on, which I'll show momentarily, but this gives us our basic tracking information. So in this case, the no positives found is referring to the fact that it's a logistic regression model. What happened in this case was that this model was supposed to have been deactivated and was not. And so at the point at which it was supposed to be pre-processed and trained, there was actually no data for it to be trained on. So uh, the positive and negative values were what would have been regressed on, but they did not exist. But if for whatever reason we wanted to investigate that further, either the error wasn't clear or we didn't already know that, I, I just happened to already know that. Um, but we can next look at the Apache Airflow log. So I'll describe Airflow in greater detail uh, further into the talk, but at this point, just understand that Airflow is how we schedule and coordinate the various tasks across Spire. And they produce these logs um, for each run, so whether that's daily or hourly or whatever the case may be, and there are certain information that are logged automatically by Airflow. That's just like their general metrics. And then additionally, we have our own logging management tools, which push other uh, metrics into this log. So we can see here just a, a basic explanation that it's a training run, that it's a Python operator, meaning it's coming from our code base. And we can see some run ID and, and run information with a, a URL that we can follow up on. So when we look next and follow up on that URL, we have a Databricks run. So I will again explain Databricks in greater detail further along the line as well. Uh, but understand that Databricks is a managed runtime of Spark. So we use uh, AWS, uh, Amazon EC2 instances, uh, to um, run our, our uh, Spark clusters managed through Databricks, and uh, they produce potentially runs such as this. This is a uh, notebook. So Databricks also has notebook integration, similar to something like Jupyter. Uh, much of Spire's code base is uh, tasks that are run internally. In certain cases, we use notebooks in production such as this. So you can see here that it is performing some task and then within our code base, that task returns a dictionary, basically a, a JSON-like dump that you can see here with some redacted information, uh, but basically just telling you something about what happened at that stage. Additionally, this information gets tagged to our data abstraction. So there are actually multiple ways to access this information, not just at the runtime level, but at the uh, data abstraction level as well. And I'll talk more about that momentarily. Uh, but this is just a basic rundown end to end of, of what a, a daily monitoring of Spire looks like. 
in addition to the various other monitoring tools uh, and, and other processes that we will do on a case-by-case -case basis. So I'll discuss the monitoring tools in Spire, uh, but additionally, as part of that, I'll discuss the Spire architecture. Because one thing I, I really want to get across here is that it's not just about the tools you use, but how you design your code base that facilitates uh, everything about machine learning, but especially in this case, monitoring. So this is a higher level representation of Spire's architecture, and I'm breaking it down into three levels. So we'll start with the task level. This is the green uh, squares. So, and then the, the black arrows are just showing data flow. So we have data pre-processing uh, and model training, which are occurring on a weekly or monthly basis, again, depending on certain logistics of the data abstraction. And then we also have the scoring, that's the inference level, which is occurring daily. And subsequently to that, a uh, certain post-processing, and then you can see in the yellow oval, the Slack report, which I've already shown. So that's the task level representation of Spire. Then there's the data level representation of Spire. So this is the red and orange cylinders. So starting from left to right, we have the data set. So the Spire data sets consist of features and targets, including internal data, third-party vendor data, uh, data that have been processed through other upstream machine learning algorithms and various other sources. And they go through a uh, normalization. Uh, and you might think, why am I talking about uh, normalization of, of data sets in a monitoring talk? But to my mind, if you normalize your data at the earliest stage, you've isolated any issues that are coming upstream so that when you're looking at just the operations, the runtime of Spire itself or of your own code base, that you can isolate out any issues that might be pertaining to those upstream processes upstream. So uh, that's why I think it's important to talk about these things in the context of monitoring. So that's data set. Then we talk about Postgres or Postgres SQL, Postgres SQL. We have a database which consists of multiple tables of data and metadata per pertaining to the uh, data abstraction and the model information and various other uh, things such as those reports I had mentioned before. And we use an object relational mapping in Python between the what, I, what I've uh, referred to as the workflows, the data abstractions, and these metadata such that both within the runtime itself or within the pipeline itself, but also independently, you can query on the model or data abstractions to understand what has happened or what is happening in your pipeline. We then have the orange cylinder, the ML flow experiment. So this is just a model tracking tool, and I'll discuss this uh, in a subsequent slide. And the end result of the scores those user propensity uh, inference scores go into a delta table, a uh, file system, which I will explain in greater detail as well. So that's the second layer of Spire uh, in, in terms of, of uh, this abstraction. And then finally, we have the airflow level. So that's the little cloud of airflow and the red arrows are showing different uh, airflow stages. And this allows us to see, for instance, that there are certain upstream tasks that are operating at one stage. And then we have the pre-processing and the training, where the training has a dependency on the pre-processing. That's another stage. And then independent of that is the scoring, which then has the various downstream dependencies for the post-processing and the reporting. And again, just the, the ability to isolate these different stages and the different levels of dependency is a valuable top-down tool in your monitoring to be able to know just from where the error occurs and when it occurs. There are many useful assumptions that you can make if you've designed your architecture well. Now I've talked quite a bit about this data abstraction. Uh, so, so what exactly is this? 
So uh, while certain ETLs and other uh, extract transform load and other processes in uh, Spire or pertaining to Spire are written in Scala, much of the core code base is written in Python. So these are Python classes or Python domain objects that we use to standardize, serialize, normalize our data. So there's the aforementioned workflows. These objects include information about the model, the business logic, the schedule for that model, uh, reports on it, even cluster information. So you could see if it is uh, actively being processed at a given stage, you can access the live logs for those stage from the domain object itself. Likewise, we have the configs. So this config allows you to uh, work within either the production environment, what's actually deployed, but also the staging environment, which is a, a separate deployment for the purposes of testing new, new features or new changes, and even a local development environment. And so in this way, you can make code base changes or database changes that uh, allow you to test things without in, in, uh, influencing what's happening in production uh, necessarily. Sometimes you don't want to do that. Uh, the data sets themselves are composed of these features and targets. I, I've mentioned these before and the importance of normalizing uh, and how that allows you to gain a, a deeper level of understanding top down of what your code base is doing. Uh, but also, as I've discussed with the architecture in these different levels, there's a sense of Spire as a library and also Spire as a runtime. So we also have these domain objects called runners and job configs, which allow you to access the, the runtimes directly. So the runner determines which workflows get run at which stages, at what time. Uh, it also gets used for the data set normalization for the features and targets. And the job config allows you to uh, manipulate what kind of EC2 instance you're using or how many uh, worker nodes or um, what uh, Databricks runtime or Spark version, all of these kinds of things that can exist both within the production runtime, but also in isolation. In terms of other tools that we use, as I've said before, we use Databricks heavily. Uh, so Databricks is our, our managed Spark runtime utilizing AWS EC2 instances, and we also use uh, the AWS S3 file system. There are the notebooks I've shown before, which are useful for data visualization, for data scientists to do various experimentation, in some cases also code base, and there are jobs. Jobs are useful so that if you have some, let's say there's some bug in the code base that we catch from our monitoring and we need a hot fix for that bug, but we don't want to put that hot, hot fix into deployment because A, it, it might be adding tech debt and, and obscuring our monitoring, uh, but B, we, we try to make our deployment process uh, very standardized and official, and so it can just be slower to do. So instead, you can use a Databricks job with its own schedule to implement a hot fix for an issue while working on a proper code base implementation to be deployed later. This way, you don't have to worry about your pristine, perfect, you know, monitoring situation that we all wish we had uh, um, getting complicated down the line due to various hotfixes. Databricks also includes uh, ML, things like MLflow and Delta Lake, which I'll discuss separately, uh, but it's part of a larger Databricks ecosystem and we utilize those integrations as well. One of those integrations is MLflow. So it's a model tracking, productionalization, serialization tool for uh, machine learning. In our case, we use it mainly for tracking. So we track the experiment ID of the Spire model and also the run ID. And this is tagged into the uh, workflow object relational mapping data uh, abstraction that I talked about before. And it, it just allows us to standardize our, our process and, and see what's happening with our models. Um, and uh, it also provides additional logging. Other tooling that we use, uh, there's, there's Delta Lake. So this is a partitioned file system 
its Parquet format in S3, and it can be queried with Spark SQL. And then uniquely for Delta Lake, as opposed to just a, a regular Parquet file, is it contains a what's called a Delta log. This Delta log gives you version control and the ability to do rollbacks. So for instance, if there's some catastrophic bug in your code and it causes you to accidentally delete a lot of data or overwrite certain data, uh, potentially you can roll, roll that back through the Delta log. You might think, why are we talking about a file system and partitioning in the context of monitoring? But uh, as anyone knows who's gone from working on you know, relatively small data to then working on big data, certain assumptions that you make such as I can easily query and visualize my data with small data don't always apply with big data. So if you have smart partitions, uh, you know, partitions on your data that are directly useful based on whatever kind of logic that you're interested in, you can efficiently load and visualize subsets of your data, such as data at a given date for a given campaign, given whatever other uh, SQL query-like assumptions you need to make. And uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, for all the monitoring tools you might have and logging uh, and look at everything and you can see the error and you can see how it's propagating, but for some reason it just isn't making sense to you. And then you look at the data and you, you, you load your data, you visualize your data frame and, and one, one look quickly, you're just like, oh, of course, this all makes sense now. So uh, that's why I think it's, it's worth talking about the uh, storage of your data in the context of monitoring. We also use Apache Airflow, as I've discussed before. We use uh, managed deployments of Airflow via astronomer.io. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about them momentarily. Airflow uses directed acyclic graphs or DAGs. These DAGs are what coordinate the stages and then within any given stage, there are any number of tasks that have their own tree-like dependencies. And so this allows you to schedule and coordinate tasks. And that's, that's how we coordinate the tasks in Spire. It also has various uh, logging, uh, both within Airflow itself, and then uh, our own logging uh, uh, monitoring tools that we add to that Airflow log as well. Within Astronomer, we can get live and historical usage met, uh, metrics and Grafana integration. Here's just a basic sort of dashboard that they provide where we can see the Kubernetes pod usage, the CPU usage, the memory usage, uh, things of that nature. But then we can go into Grafana and see the uh, additional metrics as well. So Kubernetes is just an orchestrator of the uh, um, the deployment, the, depl the Astro deployments, and we can see the various computational metrics through the Grafana visualization. And then, as I've said before, these are Spark clusters. So we can also look at the Spark UI. So this is via Databricks as well, but um, we have live and historical uh, so, so you can look at the Spark UI for an active run, also for uh, past runs. You can see here the Spark DAG itself. And uh, this was just like a random process that I pulled out. But you can see how it's, it's chunking the information across the uh, cluster. You can get the Spark SQL uh, physical and logical plans of how it's uh, partitioning and processing your data various metrics on the environment, on storage, on uh, connections like database connections, and uh, executor metrics. As seen here through what's, what they call ganglia, you get uh, computational metrics on the cluster as well as on the individual executors through a, a larger uh, graph. And again, can be live or historical. So these are just different ways of seeing what is happening computationally in terms, in terms of the data flow, um, all these different ways of interfacing with your data. Then uh, some other tooling is our own, uh, we have a command line interface that we wrote um, for Spire. It is built on top of Python using a package called Click, and it's a user level tool that is largely non-programmatic and allows for quick querying, also creation and updating it's just a way for a user who is not necessarily even a Python coder, 
let alone a uh, developer on Spire who's intimately familiar with our uh, object relational mapping and all, all of those things to quickly look at the data. And this is often a good first response as well when we see errors in that daily log that I showed at the beginning. And in the future, so we're working on a higher level public API to Spire. So this would be a Python tool based on uh, REST API principles that would allow a power user or even developer who wants to interface with Spire, again, without needing to understand the, uh, the inner workings of the code base and the object relational mapping and just get quick reports on the workflows themselves. We've also been developing a web-based graphical user interface or GUI for the metrics, uh, tentatively called Spireboard. And we've talked about separating the uh, aforementioned core library and runtime operations of Spire into separate packages that could provide for us greater flexibility for our production versus staging versus development or uh, our, our automatic versus um, out of band processes. And we've also looked at unifying dashboards such as uh, Datadog as a means of collating a lot of this information and creating specific visualizations or specific reports for our use case. And with that, uh, that is machine learning with Spire at Condé Nast in a nutshell. Thank you.